Welcome to SBME Interfaces. Our goal with this show is to introduce you to the people that interface with biomedical engineering from students and faculty to staff and industry and everyone in between. BME is a broad field that encompasses so many different perspectives, journeys, skill sets, and backgrounds, and we are excited to share them all with you. Today we're interfacing with Paul Cubbin. He's a faculty member of the Marketing and Behavioral Science Division at Saunders School of Business. He leads the Entrepreneurship Group and is the Assistant Dean Innovation. He holds a BA Honors degree from Oxford University and an MBA from Simon Fraser University. He started in industry first, including 10 years at Unilever. And since 2000, Paul has committed himself to designing innovative and applied learning experience in marketing, communication, digital marketing, and technology entrepreneurship. As well as in recent years, he has expanded venture startup programs across campus, and he is the leader and academic director of the Cre Creative Destruction Lab, Vancouver. He's also a multiple award-winning educator, including a UBC Killam Undergraduate Teaching Award. And in 2020, he became a 3M Canada National Teaching Fellow, just a handful of people across the country that have this. Welcome, Paul. Thanks very much, Pam. And uh, you're just making me feel very old. I think eventually we all end up with a long list of stuff. <laughs> so, uh, so Paul, I want to start with, uh, obviously, this past year, the, the big old elephant in the room. It's changed a lot of things for a lot of people. Um, so what do you think it has changed for academia? And especially, what do you think it's changed in the venture creation space? Yeah, look, obviously, a lot's been said about this. But I think, um, you yeah, know, we've now got a little bit of space uh, for reflection after more than a year of um, this experience. And uh, I think what's surprised myself and my colleagues is that you can actually do a remarkable amount online. Um, yeah. And it may not always be as enjoyable, but it can be really effective. Um, that said, I think we miss a sense of community. <laughs> um, and it, certainly from a teaching point of view, I'm now convinced we'll come back to the classroom stronger because to design good online teaching, we had to be very deliberate in, re in reviewing pedagogy. And, and so some of the improvements in pedagogy, I think are gonna be really organizational change, systemic reviews, uh, kind of improvements. Uh, and so, you know, yes, we're looking forward to going back to the classroom, but it will be, uh, it will be a better classroom, I think a better learning experience. And so that's on that side. And then I think on the, you know, on the research side, it really depends on what, what people are working on. But again, loss of face time is more damaging for some people than others. And obviously those who are dependent on, on, on specialist space, that's been really kind of a, 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 a bit of, a, bit of a, a, dra a drag on progress. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's always a silver lining. And, you know, we, we kind of, our rallying cry a year ago or just over a year ago was don't let a good crisis go to waste. How can we kind of come out stronger? And, um, you know, at, at the business school, that's certainly what we're, we're doing. Cool. Great, well said. Um, so taking a step back, tell us a little about your journey from industry and all the way to academic realm. Yeah, sure. Um, my, my background started in the ad agency industry. So it was interesting in many ways is, is I was thrown into doing multiple industries kind of on the, you know, I, I could do kind of pharmaceutical drugs, beer and, and computer software on the same day. Um, and uh, it kind of, it meant that you abstracted away from the detail and you thought about process uh, and about competitive um, ability to compete. And so I think that was a really good kind of early framing for me. And then I spent a, a decade with uh, Unilever, con consumer packaged goods, multinational, and um, I was doing an, an, a combination of marketing and then increasingly global innovation roles there. And again, uh, that helped me to uh, really learn to, to bridge the gaps between um, the, the scientists and people with strong technical ability and the people who were customer facing. Uh, and although that's a long time ago now, it was really formative for me. And then uh, kind of in, uh, kind of leveraging that at scale in terms of uh, global impact, global impact, um, uh, kind of at the time, predominantly economic impact, but nevertheless, being able to be based in Europe, the running test markets in Chile or in kind of, you know, other, other parts of the world. Great. So, um, uh, you know, you've, you've made your way over this, this, uh, this career to uh, Souder. Um, what brought you there? What makes it such a special place? Yeah, sure. So, 
I mean, like 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 many, so many of us in Vancouver, um, I, I I was um, brought here middle of my life. I came as a as an immigrant, and I um, was exploring what I might do. And in the first instance, uh, towards the end of the nineties, with the um, the emergence of really the first wave of uh, inter the internet. I was just a marketer and an innovator trying to understand what was going on. And so I kind of offered almost a little whimsically to design a course and run it for a local community college in internet marketing. Cause you know, there was, it was just a new area that people were trying to understand. And I read a lot and I put a course together and I found I liked it and it went well. And UBC reached out to me and said, you know, our students want to want, want this stuff. We don't have anybody teaching it. Will you come and do it? So I did it part time for a few years. Like uh, a lot of people want to get started. And a couple of years later, they, they I was, you know, we, we found a good mutual fit. So I was asked to come in and initially do more marketing courses and to try to make them experiential and applied and uh, moving mm -hmm. back to industry. But, you know, relatively quickly, I, I, I migrated towards uh, the uh, innovation and commercialization of technology piece because it really played more centrally to my interests and background and um, and um, so that's that's how I ended up there what what makes Soda a special place coming from industry I was a bit apprehensive you know I, I wasn't a research okay. academic and what su pleasantly surprised me and continues to do so nearly two decades later is, is it's a I'd say it's an open place of interested and talented people and both faculty and staff actually come together around, I think, shared missions of, uh, a shared mission of trying to use business um, for good. And that can sound a little bit corny or blase. And I think, you know, you know it's, the, it's, the, it's the often unspoken joke about business schools kind of around university campuses is, is that they, you know, oh, they're just people who want to make money. And mm -hmm. um, when you talk to our students and you talk to our faculty, that's not the driving force for people. And so I think, you know, our, our, our Dean's um, rallying cry for a, a long time now for people has been rigor, respect and responsibility. And I think it's how can we use business for good? And so in terms of then partnering with engineering or with medicine uh, or with any faculty across campus, it's suddenly how can we help take our skill set and our, and our knowledge and, and, and partner so that the fantastic scientific discoveries can kind of have impact, you know, whether it's human health, environmental health, uh, and clearly, obviously, economic health of society. And so I think it, you know, I felt, I felt, I felt, and I still feel incredibly welcomed and valued. Um, and it drives my engine to want to give back to the school. So long answer, but you can see it's authentic and, and, and personal. Sure. I, I love that reframe, though, too, that I think it's so important to to change the way we look at entrepreneurialism instead of thinking of it as, oh, you just start a business and you make money. It's more like what problem can you solve in society? Right. And, and make more money to fuel solving that problem. Right. Like, I think that's that's cool. Well, mm -hmm. and you talk and you talk about fueling. And I mean, I think, you know, there's a there's an adage uh, uh, that I often retell, particularly to newer uh, uh, employees or to student groups. And I say, you know, did you hear the one about the business school professor walking into the science lab? Uh, uh, and they say, no, I didn't. And the, the first one is, is, are you lost? Uh, uh, kind of, they say, because, you know, there's a traditional silo nature of universities, which we've been working to break down. And, and then the second is something along the lines of go away, you nasty capitalist. And this <laughs> disconnect about kind of like, you know, that's the, you know, so, so the reset that, I, that I'll do one-on-one, -on -one, and I've done many times with scientists, is, is I don't care if you make money, right? But money is oxygen for your great invention to have impact. And yeah. so, so I think the thing is, is you're right, is that reframing? And I, I tell the, the adage because that gets people to reset kind of, you know, and certainly, you know, the students are all nodding and going, yeah, I want to change the world. And yeah. now there's, yeah. a, there's a handful that want to get rich along the way, but, you know, that's not the driving force. And of course, much of our experience and our research indeed shows that, you know, people who set out to make money are often not only unsuccessful, but also miserable. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So you, you, you touched on innovation and you're now in this added role on top of everything else you do as assistant dean innovation. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, I mean, in many ways, it was a formalized formalization of what I'd been doing informally. And I think it, but, but I think significantly, it was a, a recognition by the dean, uh, my, my, my dean at the Soda School of Business, um, who I think in, in his conversations with other deans across the campus saying, 
hey, a lot of the things that we collaborate on around innovation um, are positive. And how do we do more about that? And I think, you know, in, in, in part, it was about kind of, you know, formalizing and giving kind of focus to the work we were doing kind of behind the scenes and um, providing opportunity to build bridges, I think, um, with other faculties. And the, um, I would say that um, it also clearly means that instead of it being a bit of a side of the desk project, it, 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 it is resourced and provides a bit more space. And so, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a wide range of things now that I get to go and do, but I, I would say it's kind of, you know, the, I'd say the trust of my Dean is go, go out kind of and keep talking to the people you're talking to and make good things happen, uh, which is nice. Building, building on that, what do you define as innovation? Ah, so this is a trick question. Um, um, <laughs> no. So I think in simple terms, people often make the mistake of confusing an idea with innovation. And, you know, ideas are interesting and they're a starting point, but you know, the, the, an, idea, an idea by itself is not enough. And so I'd say the innovation is taking the idea uh, from, you know, the hypothesis or that original kind of, uh, kind of uh, genesis through to actually impact um, and what you know so the impact again is it's going to be about human health or environmental health or economic health it's kind of turning it into something um, that people value um, and the transaction for the value is often initially in money but there's obviously obviously a, a whole series of other things not least kind of you know living longer living better quality lives and um, etc and um, so the um but the reason i said it was a trick question is is I think that it tends to draw people into thinking as innovators as company founders. And so, mm. so, so one of the themes that I have worked over a, a number of years uh, to uh, try to empower students to see themselves as innovators is to get away from certainly thinking of entrepreneur as hero founder. And instead mm -hmm. thinking about going into the framing of innovative thinkers and entrepreneurial thinkers. And whether you are joining a growing organization uh, that was founded some years ago, or even a large organization, which is trying to reinvent itself, be more competitive, more relevant, or, or in large institutions like our university, do we value entrepreneurial and innovative thinkers? Absolutely. So I would almost say, what does it mean to be innovative? Right? And then, sure, some innovations lead to businesses, right? but there are many innovative developments which are of high value to organizations. So uh, I think, I think it, it may sound like a subtlety, but it suddenly also allows 10 times or 100 times as many people to see themselves as innovators. Man, I agree with you so much. I'm so glad you said that. Uh, the, the, I, I really do believe the language we use has power. It's very important. So even those little subtleties, I think they're really important to help people you know, see themselves in these, these positions. Um, so we talk about collaboration, we talk about how you're trying to break down silos, that's a big part of what makes the School of Biomedical Engineering what it is, we're, we're trying to break down all those barriers. So what excites you about the school and about its potential? Yeah, no, again, great question. I mean, I think you've touched on some of them, but I'll, I mean, I'll play them back in the, the, the words that I've uh, kind of had in my mind. I mean, it's, it's interdisciplinary, and, and I think there's great power in uh, an interdisciplinary approach, uh, particularly, uh, you know, as we see more and more evolving technical interdisciplinarity, as well as layering over, uh, obviously, the business perspective that I come from. Um, but I think particularly in terms of the UBC School of Biomedical Engineering, I think the fact that it's very applied and it's very fast moving to impact. And you know, maybe people would say, well, because it's new, it's just getting started. And therefore, you know, we're seeing this kind of acceleration. But, you know, the the recruitment of talent from around the world, uh, the fact that many of the talented people being hired have got a real translational bent. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. obviously, they need to have deep kind of uh, capabilities in their in their research, but their their interest is to also translate. Um, that to me is super exciting because, you know, I'm looking from a business point of view, we can help talented, ambitious uh, scientists with embryonic and emerging technologies to create mm -hmm. businesses that have impact. But if there isn't a pipeline, there's nothing to help. 
And uh, what I yeah. see with, with the biomedical engineering school is, is I see this kind of burgeoning pipeline of, of potential. And so, yeah, I'm super excited. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Creative Destruction Lab? Yeah, sure. Um, how long do you have? Uh, no, I'm just uh, joking. The, so it's obviously, it's something of a quirky name. Um, it was founded um, nine years ago now uh, at the Rotman School and the University of Toronto by a colleague and friend, uh, Professor Jay Agrawal. Uh, he did his PhD at SODA, uh, some uh, um, sometime in the mid late nineties. And um, what I found was that there were a number of people, this is going back about six years or seven years ago when, when CDL was a small program uh, and not well known at the time. There were six people from Vancouver that were getting on a plane five times a year on their own dollar. And they were, they, but basically what they told me was we're redirecting our pay it forward time from what we were doing in Vancouver to this program, Creative Destruction Lab in Toronto. And I said, why? Vancouver needs, you know, you're locals and Vancouver needs all the help we can get. And they mm -hmm. said, this is just a better use of our pay it forward time, right? The uh, quality of the early stage ventures and the other mentors and the way the system values our time and is, and, and, and is efficient, and it's just a better use of our time. And for me, that was, it was, a, it was a double edged signal. It was both a, a light of opportunity, but it was also a light of threat for Vancouver because you know we all know Vancouver uh, kind of low on head offices and lots of talent uh, kind of, uh, the, but you know, we, we, need, we needed to build in my mind, kind of a critical mass of companies and talent if we were then going to you know, have something to then continue to build on going forward. And so um, I, I asked the Jay to come and give a seminar some six years ago here at UBC on a very rainy day on what he was, what Creative Destruction Lab was and why he was doing it. And one of the things that he's, in fact, that evening over dinner with my dean and the dean of applied science, uh, we went out for dinner and I asked him why he was doing what he was doing because he was a you know accomplished researcher and, and educator, and this was non-trivial. And he looked all of us, including the two deans in the eye, and he said, this is about the future of a post-natural resource, Canadian economy and society. And so it gave me goosebumps. And I just said, you know, and I also said, you can't do it on your own from Toronto. Well, I don't think you can. And so the long story short is, is we said, can we systemize this and scale it initially in Vancouver and then we, across the country and to other, uh, to other sites uh, kind of uh, further afield so that we can help to systematically and at scale build massive um, businesses with high impact in a series of technically based verticals. So here in Vancouver now we have um, four um, different CDL uh, focus areas. Uh, one, one is in more of an advanced computing area, one's in uh, the area of uh, climate change, and then two of them are in health. Um, one really around devi devices and health, and, and, and health IT, and one more in the uh, therapeutics and drug discovery area. And so um, we're, we're really excited. We built, we're, we're, and we've, we've got an engine here um, for um, developing what comes out of the Biomedical Engineering School, the School of Medicine, and, and across the university. And, be, and, be, and beyond UBC. So it's, again, it's a longer answer, but CDL is on, it's unlike um, most accelerators and startup programs. We don't provide physical space. Uh, we don't try and get people to move. We have companies that are deliberately from outside of Vancouver and outside of Canada who provide a global benchmark for, for, for what um, we're trying to build. And we're really a marketplace for judgment. And a marketplace for judgment is really saying for the, for the first time founder, there's a thousand things screaming at them to be done. What should they mm -hmm. prioritize on in the next sprint milestone? And so we focus on three objectives for the next eight weeks and then mentors who will help them to achieve that. De-risk de the early stage venture, make it investable uh, and get it, get, it, get it out of the gate. So that, that's CDL, that's what we're doing and we're, we're proud to be part of the network. 
Mm. You and you talked about uh, uh, you know this 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 wonderful engine that is here um, in some of some of my research on you uh, before before this interview too. I've noticed that you've said that anchoring talent is key to growing the Vancouver life sciences sector. Basically, um, anchoring talent to this this engine. Um, can you expand a little bit more on that and maybe some of the things that we have done to anchor said talent? Yeah, no, I, I mean it's a it's a it's a good question that I think. You know, one of the things that happens, I think, in Canada generally, and certainly in Vancouver historically, is is we we can kind of like be, you know, underconfident in what we're <laughs> capable of and what we've done, and then we can be a bit kind of like um, self-critical of things when they go wrong or when they don't quite go to play. And I think if we look back in the life sciences sector here in Vancouver, you know, you know over the last thirty years, and um, and you know it's, e it's easy to just be looking at sound bites and kind of Twitter feeds and so on. But let, you know the, the history here matters. We look back at companies like Angiotech and QLT, incredibly talented researchers who innovated and built really world class companies. And as we know, they don't exist here now. But the work, the the the, the science continues to be commercialized and to have impact on 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 tens of thousands of patients. So we built things and then we lost them. And so they're not a tax base, they're not an employment center here. And more critically, there, there, there isn't the, then the kind of the, uh, the anchor companies around which other companies can, can build. So I think you know, what, we're see what we're seeing today is a real opportunity um, in, li in life sciences here. You know, and obviously the, you know, there's, there's um, Abcellera and Zymeworks and Acuritas and you know, um, uh, Aspect and Notch and Chinook. And you know, so we've got, more than two companies and we've got i think we've got people who are trying to learn from that last generation and say how do we actually anchor here we've got people who are committed to trying to build here and so that we become a destination not just a source for the world and um, mm -hmm. and so that's what i would say and one of the critical things about having multiple companies in play at different stages large medium and then emerging is to build these companies, we need to be able to attract in, ta although there's, there's strong talent locally in many areas, particularly in senior management, people who built um, and scaled um, significant sized companies, there's a relative shortage of talent and we need to be able to attract people from other parts of the world. So they need to, to de-risk it for them. There needs to be more than one opportunity here so that they don't move their mm. families halfway around the world and then find there's nothing else if job one doesn't work out. So again, I think, we're at this kind of really interesting time and over the next few years, we'll either build a critical mass or we'll start to see things unraveling again. And of course, we, we want the first of those two to happen. Absolutely. Beyond talent, recruitment, retention, what else do you think is needed to uh, sort of maintain ventures in Vancouver or in Canada in general? Wow, that's a big question. I mean, look, there is a range of issues from kind of, you know, um, policy uh, on taxation and research kind of incentives and credits through to space. Um, so, um, I mean, I think, you know, it would be hard to imagine a year ago that um, a life sciences company would be putting up a building of, I think, 380,000 square feet. Um, kind of in Vancouver uh, and mm. of course that's the Absalera story story uh, that kind of is you know part, partly enabled by the recent financing and so I think space is key I think there are a number there are a number of uh, key players um, who understand that um, and um, so I will focus on that uh, but as I say there are other policy issues as well so that you know people people who are going to build global companies in Vancouver need to be able to do so confident that they have a market that's bigger than Canada. Mm, that's really well said. Um, all right, so so uh, backing up from the, uh, the the heavy questions here, with all of this going on in your life and all of the things you have to oversee, how do you unwind? Huh. Um, <clears throat> for many years, I, I did ultra mountain run, running, kind of so 50K, 50 mile, even once a hundred miler. So, um, and wow. I did that for about 30 years and the, the body doesn't kind of, um, kind of like it quite as much now. So I'm kind of, rather than racing, I do more kind of uh, hiking. Um, and so, you know, if it, if, it, if, it, if it actually, if it opens this year, then I'll, I'll go and do the West Coast Trail in the summer. 
um, skiing in the winter. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, those, those, those are things. I, I actually quite like cooking and baking and drinking a good glass of red wine too. Yeah. Good. Uh, a question that came to mind right now, I'm just curious, because it seems teaching is something that you love and do well. What's one course you taught past year that you really enjoy teaching? What's one of your favorite courses? I think my, my favorite course to teach over, over the years really uh, has been um, a course called New Venture Design. And um, I mean, New Venture Design is the undergrad version of the course. The graduate version is called Technology Entrepreneurship. So they're really twin courses, undergrad and grad. And basically they're half business students and they're, they're half STEM students. Um, and uh, it's very much an applied course where the teams are made up roughly 50% from business and 50% from STEM. And it's a, it's a build a business course. And so, and I think one of the nice things about it is, is, is that we try to create a safe place for students to fail. Uh, I think too often in, in school people, students have an unrealistic sense of pressure that they almost put on themselves uh, that they feel mm -hmm. that, you know, if I don't get 95% then I failed. And so the idea that we set up a course where we say innovation and building a business is really hard you need to learn how to run experiments and fail and then go back and come back stronger. And we're not gonna grade you on a failed experiment. We're gonna grade you, for instance, on the reflective learning afterwards. That's really refreshing, uh, I think, for students. Uh, it also takes them outside their comfort zone. Um, and what I'd say is, is although we, we periodically see businesses created out of those companies, more often than not, two to five years later, we find people doing amazing things and they call us and they say, you know what, that was the course that actually changed how I looked at things because, you know, I, I, uh, I learned something that I can still use now. Uh, it wasn't just memorizing. So, so new venture design and technology entrepreneurship. I love that. Uh, the, one of the concepts I really, really love uh, that I've encountered over the past few years is a growth mindset. And that's what it is. You're teaching a growth mindset, right? To take the hit and then come back with all the lessons. Uh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And there's a, and I think there is a chat, there's a challenge with the pressure on grades. Um, and I think it, what it causes us to do as educators is to rethink again, I touched at the beginning about kind of the challenges to, to pedagogical design. I mean, it, you know, you, the incentives have to align with what we're trying to achieve. And if the incentives are based around kind of a maybe tr more traditional grading rubric, then we can't, it's really hard to encourage a growth mindset. So you're right. I think this mm -hmm. is, it's very applicable to, to being innovative, whether one is an entrepreneur or whether one is just wants to have a growth mindset for everything one could do in any type of career. And so I think there's a real responsibility on us as educators to, um, yeah. to walk the talk and to set the incentives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, uh, so we got time for one more. So uh, are there any initiatives or projects or endeavors that you're overseeing right now that you are super excited about and you think we should get excited about it too? Ha, yeah. And um, yeah, look, I think the um, there's one in particular I'm working with linked to, linked to CDL around climate and um, where we're partnered up with the X Prize Cli uh, Carbon Removal Prize, uh, which is a $100 million prize to be awarded in four years time to um, new emerging ventures that, that demonstrate the potential to remove at least a gigaton of carbon from the atmosphere each year. So the reason I like that is, is it's, it's a big, hairy, audacious goal on something that matters. And I mentioned that mm -hmm. because I think mapping that to what we might do in, in, in for instance, in, in human health, um, there's many, many ways one can look at that. You know, so many researchers are really working on these big, hairy, audacious goals. And I think, I think the thing that inspires me a lot about this is, you know, if we go back 18 months ago, nobody had heard about COVID-19. And if you'd asked somebody how long it takes to develop a vaccine, they would have said about 10 years. And then we just developed five in a year. And it took money, but the talent was there. It was about focus on what mattered. And so I think I give you an example of something really exciting because it's current around carbon removal because for sure human health matters, but if we don't have a planet, human health won't matter so much. Uh, and I think <laughs> that the inspiration around, I think, I think too often we try to do, we, we as a society and we as individuals, we try to do too many things. And it, it, it's this idea of what are we gonna focus on? If we can align, then we've got the ability and the talent. So let's align on a few things that matter 
uh, and I think you know the, 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 that's what inspires me. Um, and let's uh, do the same. And I think you know if I bring it back to you as our as our hosts here in this this uh, uh, series around the School of Biomedical Engineering, I got. I was I was on a walk with Peter a week or so ago, and we walked up to campus, and um, we we walked past the hole in the ground, which is going to become the School of Biomedical Engineering. And I just got goosebumps because yeah. I just thought, you know, what we can do here. Right? Uh, this was kind of like evidence about change, um, yeah. and so yeah, uh, that I'll be honest, it really it really excites me. The fact is, is you know, as, as I think you know, we we just finished delivering a first course uh, um, from SADA for the School of Biomedical Engineering students in commercialization of medical devices. And although it's a small thing in itself, it's symbolic of people who, when they say they want to partner, really want to make progress. And so, uh, you know, there's a series of things there that excite me and they all come together. And uh, hopefully um, between us, we can do great stuff. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Paul. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. And thank you for being a, a, a strong, superb partner for the school and wish you all the best in the coming years. Well, thank you both. Uh, thanks, Miguel. Thanks, Pam. And um, uh, let's go forward together and uh, change the world.